Will you take the Word of God this morning and turn to Luke 22? Luke 22. While you're doing that, let me welcome you as Scott has already done. We're so glad that you've joined us today as we've come together to worship at Westside. I'd like to take just a moment and express the personal appreciation of myself, Tammy, and all of our family for your many words of kindness, condolences in the passing of her father. We uh, have had a busy couple of weeks, as you might imagine, but we're very, very thankful for the hope and the confidence that is in Jesus Christ. Tammy's dad was a preacher for over 60 years, and uh, for us to be able to come together and celebrate, along with all the members of our family, a life well-lived and to be able to rejoice in the hope of eternity was truly a blessing. And though we will miss him, our hearts are filled with joy, for we know with assurance where he is, and we are grateful for that. C.S. Lewis said that there were two types of people in the world. First, he said there was the type of person who prays Not my will, but thy will be done. Second, he said there was the individual who prays, not thy will, but my will be done. Well, here in Luke 22, we find a dramatic description of two individuals who personified these two attitudes. One of these men was known for his selfless spirit. The other was known for his sinister scheme. One of these men was known for his care and compassion. The other was known for his calloused cruelty. One of these men was known for his faithfulness. The other was known for his foolishness. One of these men was known for his love and loyalty. The other was known for his brutality and betrayal. One of these men is revered for his sacrifice. The other is reviled because of his selfishness. Here in Luke 22, we find the stark contrast between Judas and Jesus. It's a contrast that all of us need to take note of because it pictures the two warring elements that each one of us must contend with in this life, the element of selfishness and the element of sacrifice. I want you to see, first of all, this morning the selfishness of Judas, the selfishness of Judas. Now let me ask you as we began, have you ever known anyone, any man by the name of Judas? (laughs) I doubt it. I seriously doubt it. Oh, you've known men who were named Matthew. We've got some Matthews right here. You've known men named Mark or Luke or John or Paul or Andrew or Philip, and you've maybe even known a Stephen or two. But none of us has ever known, I doubt it, a man by the name of Judas because of the stigma and scorn that is attached to that name. Well, I want you to notice what Luke records about Judas right here in Luke 22, verses 3 through 6. He says, now Satan entered into Judas, who is called Iscariot, being one of the twelve. And he went and discussed with the chief priest and officers how he might betray him to them. They were glad and agreed to give him money. And so Judas consented and began looking for an opportunity to betray him to them apart from the crowd. Now, 
It's very important that we understand a few things about what was going on at this particular time in the life of Jesus. We've come to the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry. Now, the Jewish council was made up of several different sects of Jews, groups of Jews. There were the Sadducees, who were sort of the religious liberals of their day. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. And then there were the Pharisees, who were the more conservative group, they insisted on strict adherence to the law of God as well as a strict adherence to the traditions that had been passed down from generation to generation. These two groups obviously didn't agree on many things, but there was one thing upon which there was complete unanimity. That was they had to do something with Jesus. They had to get rid of Jesus. They wanted to kill him. Jesus' popularity with the crowds had continued to increase. The week before, Jesus had entered into Jerusalem riding on a colt as people laid palm branches before him on the road and and cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna, praise be to God. On Tuesday of this week, Jesus had gone into the temple where he saw the money changers and he burned with anger at what they were doing and drove them out and turned their tables over and said, it is written, my father's house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. So there was complete magnanimous unanimity among these Jewish leaders, that Jesus had to be killed. But how to do it? How to do it? They were afraid of inciting a riot with the crowd. There was great tension in the relationship between the Jews and the Romans. Earlier in Luke 13, verses 1 and 2, we Read how Pilate's soldiers had massacred a group of Jewish Galileans who had come to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices. In the months leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus, there was a group of Jews who had mounted an insurrection against Rome. They were led by a man named Barabbas. And so the Jewish leaders were concerned that if they seized Jesus openly, a riot might begin and the Roman soldiers would clamp down hard on them during the week of Passover. It was quite a dilemma. Now I want you to notice a couple of things about what Luke says here. Luke says that Satan entered into Judas. Satan was looking for the right man at the right time, at the right place. He found all three in Judas. In Judas, he found someone who cracked the door open so Satan could rush in. I think it's important to notice a couple of other passages. For instance, in Matthew 26, verses 14 through 16, we find that it was Judas who went to the Pharisees and asked them, or went to the, uh, the uh, Jewish uh, council and asked them how much they would give him to betray Jesus. And they agreed to give him 30 pieces of silver, the price for a common slave. And in John 6, verse 64, Jesus made a, a very important statement. Jesus said to his disciples, there are some among you who do not believe. Can you believe that? He's talking to his followers. And he is saying, there are some among you who do not believe. John says that Jesus knew from the very beginning who did not believe and who would betray him. And on down in John 6, verses 70 and 71 John, uh, Jesus says, have I not chosen 
you speaking to the 12, and yet one of you is a devil. Have I not chosen you? And yet one of you is the devil. He was speaking, John says, of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who would betray him. Now, why did Jesus choose Judas? Was he a bad judge of character? I don't think so. Jesus was concerned about doing the will of his father. He knew that at the end of his earthly sojourn, there was a cross. Fast forward to the Garden of Gethsemane. On that dark betrayal night, Jesus has gone deep into the garden, leaving behind the disciples, and even Peter, James, and John have been left to watch and pray. And Jesus goes in solitude and falls on his face to the ground. And there he prayed intently, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, but not as I will, but as you will. He does this three times with his sweat as great drops of blood falling upon the ground. And then in the midst of that dark stillness, there is the distant sound of clanking chains and armor. And there are dots of light representing torches of soldiers making their way up out of Jerusalem on that hill to the east of the city upon which the Garden of Gethsemane is placed. And soon Jesus found himself no longer in solitude, but surrounded by a group of soldiers from the chief priest and from the Romans. Suddenly, stepping out of the shadows, there came a man. Who was it? He stepped forward. And he said, Greetings, Master. Or as the King James Version would say, Hail, Master. And then he kissed Jesus. I'm telling you this morning, that kiss burned like a coal out of hell. There has never been a more treacherous, treasonous display of mock affection in the history of humanity. Now here's what disturbs me most about Judas. Here's what troubles me most about Judas. Do you realize none of the other disciples recognized who Judas was? None of them. At the Last Supper, Jesus had said, one of you is going to betray me, the one who dips in the cup with me. What did, the, what did the apostles do? Do you notice this? There wasn't a one of them that pointed their finger at Judas and said, yep, there he is. There wasn't a one of them who pointed their finger at Judas and said, it's him. Instead, they all began saying, Lord, is it I? Is it, is it I? What would you have done? You know what I would have done if I'd been there sitting there? I, I may well have done this. I would, I, you know who I would have looked at, Rags? I'd have pointed a finger at Peter. He's the one that's always getting into trouble, right? Think about Judas for a moment. Judas had the right association. I mean, he had been for three years with Jesus, following along, listening to Jesus as he taught. Constantly, he had heard a lot of sermons. He'd been to a lot of small groups. He had done all of these great things. He had the right association, right? Not only did he have the right association, he had the right reputation. 
out of all of the followers of Jesus, out of the 12, who was the one chosen to handle the money? Judas. Who do you choose as the church treasurer? Some scoundrel? I don't think so. You choose somebody that you know has some integrity about them. You choose somebody that you feel like you can trust. Judas had a good reputation among the apostles. Not only did he have the right association, the right participation, but he also had the right, or he, the right reputation. He had the right participation. He had been involved. He was a worker. He'd gone out and preached. He had helped serve the 5,000 with the, with the loaves and the fish. And yet no one recognized it was Judas. And today, we may come to this church building and, and we may sit in these pews and sing the songs and go through all of the motions and trappings of modern day 21st century American religion, but that is no guarantee that we believe. There are some here who do not believe just as there were in the day of Jesus. There are some here who do not believe. Now in stark contrast to the selfishness of Judas, there is the sacrifice of Jesus. Luke gives us some details about the Last Supper, beginning in verse 7 of this chapter. He tells us, for instance, that Jesus told Peter and John to go into Jerusalem and there to look for a man carrying a pitcher of water to follow that man to whatever house he went to, to enter that house and ask the master of the house to show them the guest chamber, an upper room where they might prepare the Passover. Now, a couple of things about that. First of all, Luke is the only gospel writer that gives us the name of the two disciples chosen by Jesus to go into the, uh, the city, Peter and John. And you might think it's a little bit odd to look for a man with a pitcher of water. Wouldn't there be dozens of men carrying water? No, because that's normally what women would have done in that culture. So for a man to be carrying this pitcher of water might have been an unusual sight. But it was there that the Passover meal was prepared. Now, come on down to verse 19, and I want you to look at this. There as the Passover meal begins. First of all, Luke, let me just briefly mention this. Luke gives a little different account than the other gospel writers. Luke has the supper beginning with a cup, and then, a bread, then the, the, the breaking of bread, and then another cup. I've got a little note on that in the notes if you want to look at it. But... Notice in verse 19, Jesus took that bread and he said, this is my body. Now notice this, which is given for you. Given. Do you see the difference between Judas and Jesus? Judas was interested in what he could get. Jesus is interested in what he can give. This is my body which is given for you. This is my body, which is going to be handed over to the chief priests and is going to be beaten and brutalized by the guards. This is my body that is going to be taken before Pilate and then Herod and then Pilate again in trial. This is my body which is going to have a crown of thorns embedded in its scalp. This is my body, which is going to be whipped to within an inch of its very life by the Roman executioner as he scourges Jesus. This is my body, which is going to be exchanged for a common murderer and criminal. This is my body, which is going to be led to that hill called Golgotha, and there is going to be hung on a rugged, rugged cross, wooden cross, exposed 
to the world in shame and ultimately is going to die for you. And then in verses 20 and 21, he took the cup and said, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant of my blood. Not only am I giving you my body, I'm giving you my blood. I'm giving you my life. The life was in the blood I heard a story about a little boy who was about six, seven years old and had a sister who was several years older. She became very ill with a serious uh, 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 disease that was going to require a blood transfusion. She had a very rare type of blood, and they found out that the only match they could find was her little brother, about six or seven years old. They went to him and said, son, would you be willing to give blood so that your sister can receive a transfusion. Well, he didn't really understand that. His first question was, will it hurt? And they said, well, it, it'll, it'll hurt a little bit at first, but then it'll be okay, and everything will be fine. He thought about it for just a moment, and he said, uh, yes, I'll, I'll do that. I'll do that. And so they, they laid him out on, the, on the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the bed there, and they started that transfusion. The needle pricked a little bit as it went into his arm initially, but they taped it, and everything was pretty comfortable, and he just laid there with his eyes open, and then he looked up at the nurse, and he said, when do I die? She said, what, sweetheart? He said, when do I die? She said, what do you mean? He said, well, I'm giving my sister my blood. When do I die? He thought that by giving his blood, that meant he was giving his life for her life. And he willingly did that. That is exactly what Jesus did for you. He willingly gave his life for your life. The sacrifice of Jesus. Now notice third, the sentence of judgment. We tie all of this together. The story doesn't end there on that betrayal night. In fact, the story doesn't end until sometime later. If you go over to the book of Acts chapter 1, and remember the book of Acts was also written by Luke. It's as if it were the second volume of a two-volume set, Luke, Acts. And so you come over to Luke or to Acts chapter 1. What happened after Judas had betrayed Jesus and Jesus had been crucified on the cross? What happened after the resurrection and after Jesus had appeared to many of his followers? Well, here in Acts chapter 1, we get a glimpse at what the outcome of these two men was. In Acts 1 verse 10, Jesus ascended into the sky. His apostles standing around watching as he ascended before them and two men dressed in white apparel said, you men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking? Do you not know that this same Jesus who has been taken up from you will once again return? What a glorious promise. But what about Judas? Well, if you look down to verse 18, you're going to find a very disturbing verse. Let's back up just a little bit, and we know this from Matthew 27, that Judas, after he had betrayed Jesus, felt very guilty and remorseful over what he had done. He did his best to try to return that money to the Jewish leaders, but because that money had been used as, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to buy someone, they would not accept it. Judas threw the money into the court, it was gathered and used to buy a plot of ground to bury paupers. And then Judas took that same hand that had dined at the table with Jesus and fashioned a hangman's noose and put it around his neck. 
He found an old scraggly tree on the edge of a cliff, tied that rope to the tree, and stepped off, hanging himself. Judas thought he would end it all. But my friend here, let me tell you, listen to me. Here is the fallacy of suicide. Somebody says, well, I'm just going to end it all. No, you don't. You don't end it all. Judas didn't end it all. You may kill this body, but you cannot kill the soul. That soul is going to go on and have an eternal destination in heaven or hell. And Judas killed the body. And we don't know how long the body of Judas hung there. It may have been a few days. It may have been a week or more. But we can only imagine hanging there in the hot sun, that body began to bloat. Not a pretty picture. The birds of the air began coming and picking bits of flesh from it. And then someone braving that awful stench came by and took a sword and cut that rope and the body fell headlong. This is in Acts 1.18. The body fell headlong and like an overripe melon burst with its entrails spilling out onto the ground. That's not Steve, that's Luke writing in Acts 1.18. Is that pretty graphic? Does that get our attention? <laughs> Folks, I'm telling you, there's a choice that we make in our lives. We're either going to be a Judas or a Jesus. We're either going to be a person of selfishness or a person of sacrifice. That's the choice that you and I must make. What's your choice today? What do you choose? Who will you follow in your life? Will you consider it seriously this morning? And if you need to come and put Christ on in baptism, we urge you to do that right now while we stand and while we sing.